Hello, and welcome to How I Built This Resilience Edition. <clears throat> Excuse me, how is everybody doing? Um, so as many of you know, we launched this series several months ago, um, right after the pandemic, to talk about how businesses are building resilience during this really challenging time. Um, and since then, we've done uh, a week on the food industry. We did a whole week on the fashion and beauty industry. Um, and this week, we were planning to do a whole week on the entertainment industry. Um, we were going to have guests on every day um, this whole week. But, um, but of course, because of the events happening across the country, we decided to take a pause. Um, we didn't want to take any attention away from a much, much more important conversation happening around the country and around the world about racial justice. Um, this is a really hard moment in the world and in the U.S. Um, we've got a health crisis, a political crisis, an economic crisis, um, and of course, a long simmering crisis, a 400-year-old crisis, you could say, um, over racial injustice. And, and really the failure in America to ever reckon with and come to terms with our past. Um, so today our conversation might be a little bit different than usual. Um, we welcome your questions on Facebook and Twitter um, and YouTube for Troy Carter. We'd already scheduled to have Troy Carter on the show this week. Troy is a friend of the show. Um, we told his incredible story of growing up in West Philly, um, you know, broke with no money, to becoming one of the most influential people in the music in this industry, to repping Lady Gaga and John Legend and Megan Trainor and so many others. Um, he joined us at the High Built This Summit in November. It was so great to have you there, Troy. Um, Troy is the co-founder of a tech and music firm called Q&A. We're so happy you, uh, you could be with us. Troy, welcome. Thank you for being here. Well, th thank you for having me, Guy. It's um, always a pleasure to, to sit and talk to you. How how are you doing? You know, um, I, I, I can't even lie and say I'm doing well right now. You know, um, I think um, I'm probably where a lot of people are right now. Just, you know, I think already dealing with um, sort of the, the global health crisis and um, sort of the the... The, the sort of mental impact that I think it's, it's, it's had on people throughout the world is you're just trying to sort of readjust your life and, and, and in our case, readjusting our lives and our, and our business. And then um, to sort of have the events that, that unfolded over the last few weeks and, um, and, that, and the, the aftershocks of, of those events happen um as well i think it, it's been a, it's been a lot so just kind of work just unpacking um just things uh emotionally and um but also intellectually and strategically and um and just getting to work on 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 some of these issues um how are you talking to your kids about it you know what my um my my 17 year old daughter she was actually at the the protests in um, in LA um, right before like things got crazy on uh, on on Saturday, and you know for, for for me as scary as it is you know to have her at one of the one of these protests, to be honest, which is just as scary to be black in America, you know, and um, but not wanting to uh stop her from expressing her, her 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 feelings and exercising her rights as an american citizen and you know on the phone with my 24 year old son as you know you got protesters going throughout his the neighborhood that 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 he lives um just making sure that he's physically physically safe so you know i think you know for, for me this is this is where I think it's a, it's a eye opening moment for a lot of people in America, just to, to be honest, this is like everyday life for a lot of um, African Americans in, in, in our country. And, um, you know, recently I was on a trip uh, um, probably five months ago with my YPO forum, which is, you know, Young President's um, organization. And we did a retreat to Mexico City, and it's 10 of us. And we get out of our um, out of the SUV to pull up to the hotel. All of the guys go in the back to get their bags. And soon, the moment I go in the back to get my bag, I get attacked by security, like physically attacked by by by, by security. 
And it was their, you know, and I'm the only black guy in my YPO forum. And, but it was a crazy moment because, you know, they've heard me talk about this before, but to actually see this in, in, in action. And, um, but it's, it's just this bias that's kind of built, built in. But um, I'm glad this is being addressed. And, um, and now, now it becomes a real conversation. Um, just a reminder that we're taking your questions. If you're watching now um, on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter for Trent Carter, we'd love to to hear your thoughts too. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, as a parent, Troy, like I'm sure you struggle, right? Because on the one hand, I mean, your kids are independent adults, right? And they want to be there and express their anger um, and you want to support that. But also as a parent, you're worried about their safety. Um, and I'm sure that must have been kind of an anguishing um, just thing for you to to go to kind of think about. Yeah, ab absolutely. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's, the, it's the reality of, of, of what we have to deal with, though. Like, I, I, you know, one of one of my sons is in the music industry and I worry about him traveling. <laughs> you know, just it, it's th these are things that I, that I genuinely worry about. I was on the phone with you know my best friend and co-founder Jay Irvin um, the other day, and um, I, I have I have this Airstream, and he called up asking to borrow the Airstream to drive from uh, L.A. to to North Carolina, where his mother lives. Him and his son, that's um, nineteen, and his mother called him from North Carolina and said, "I'm worried about you driving down here because you know the South is still the South." You know, so I, I, I rather we wait this, wait this out. But when, you know, when he and I t spoke, it's like, this is like a conversation that a mother would have with her son in the, in the 50s or 60s during the, during the civil rights movement. And the fact that we still have to worry about, you know, our lives as we drive across the country to do, to do a road trip, it's just a different set of, of concerns that, we still live with as parents and as and as, and as citizens, and um, and it's hard to like it's hard to for people to really understand it, and especially like somebody made a comment in a chat room I was in the other night um, uh, about how money could change it, and I'm like it doesn't it doesn't money doesn't matter, and and power doesn't doesn't matter. It's like you know, it's it's a it's it's just this bias that that's sort of baked in with with um, in the in the recipe of, of of America that that we that we've had to live with. But now I think what we've seen that's different with these protests, it's um, this is this is what I consider just a merger of the left behind, like where I, I feel like. You know, with George Floyd, this you know that was the sort of spark of the, of the fire, but yeah. I think underlying this was a, a merger of the left behind, where this this these are white, black, Asian, Hispanic people that have been you know saddled with student debt, people who can't pursue the American dream because of just the way that the um, the economic divide right now, people who feel like you know they that they're not going to have their shot. And I think we, what we're seeing in the streets right now is just a merger of all of this built up frustration. You know, Troy, I, I mean, it's amazing because I, I used to be a news anchor. I used to host, I'd be, I was one of the hosts of All Things Considered 10 years ago um, on NPR. And I mean, in this past decade, you know, we've had Trayvon Martin, we've had so many examples, but I mean, huge movements that were launched because of these these cases right um michael brown i mean it feels like we we're sort of uh, it's it's strange because already 10 years ago i i feel like we started to have these conversations and nothing has changed and it's um it's just very very depressing <laughs> i don't know i don't know any what any other word to, to use yeah it, it's um I, we, the, the difference now, right, you know, where 
uh, I wrote I wrote a letter to my staff yesterday, and because it, it it took me a while just to kind of even really talk openly about this, and um, and I referenced the Rodney King, right? And you know we had technology at that point, which was like the 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 camcorder. And, you know, so finally, you know, with Emmett Till, you didn't have technology to sort of address that, right? And then when we saw the incident with, um, with, with Karen and, and, the bird, and the bird watcher in New York and in, in Central Park, and we saw, you know, a, 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 a white woman weaponize her privilege. And, got, and actually, it was, it was fascinating to me to actually watch the process because that like to actually see the process and the octave go up in her voice with fear that octave was was a dog whistle that that people who who could hear it knew what that note was and to to see the to see the process of, of privilege in action i think hit a nerve with people because people aren't used to actually seeing that and then seeing an innocent person on the other end actually do that. What kind of pissed me off with it though, you know, in the news the next day, you know, I'm reading the New York Post and everything and it's talking about, you know, the guy had a Harvard degree, you know, he, he was a bird watcher, he's on the board of, of, of this, you know, society and these things. Who cares? Right. He was, a, and it, he was it, we shouldn't have to justify any of those facts. He shouldn't have to have a Harvard degree or yeah. be a bird watcher to be an innocent person being accused of, of, of something like that that could have ended up in, in him being arrested or, or, or his death. And this happens so many times per day throughout America. And, you know, I think what, 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 what's happened is within this truncated period of time, people have been able to see these things all back to back on camera within a matter of a few weeks at a time when people have had this pent up frustration from being in their homes, being away from their friends, being away. And so people are ju it's just bursting at the seams right now and, 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 and all of this frustration. What I hope is that this isn't a moment that this isn't just a, a, a blip on our historical radar, that this can be a catalyst for change. Because like, it, cause if, 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 it isn't, if this is just a moment, shame, shame on America. You know, Troy, I, um, I lived in Germany for, for two and a half years as a, as a reporter from 2000 to 2003. Um, and what, what really struck me about Germany, and Germany is an imperfect country. There's racism, there's anti-Semitism. Um, and, but Germany, I mean, I, I am related to many, many people who were burned at, to ash in concentration camps. My grandmother would never set foot in Germany. Neither would my grandparents, none of my grandparents would, but they, they embarked on a decades long experiment to reckon with their past. You know, every school child goes to a death camp. Um, the German government honors memory of the victims. It's not perfect, but but they have become a healthier society and a stronger society um, and, and really a, a more peaceful society because they have made a collective national attempt to reckon with their past. Um, it really struck me tw 20 years ago when I lived there that, um, and I'm embarrassed to say it took me that long, but you know, I remember thinking the United States has never done that. They've never done what Germany did. They, they've never had a truth and reconciliation commission like South Africa. And, and it sort of occurs to, to me, I think, to, to many people that we're sort of reaping what we sowed as a country, you know, for our failure to to reckon with with, with 400 years of, of slavery and oppression. It, it, it's, it's, it's almost the equivalent of a person having to drive past a statue of their of their rapist every day so so like in, in in america where you still have statues of oppressors and and sort of um you know with I, I, like only five years ago i remember you know where 
uh, we were managing Megan Trainer, and we went on this uh, a state a tour a concert tour of state fairs, and um, this was our first time doing it. So I decided to take my wife and my two daughters, um, and we you know we're on a tour bus, and we get to um, a place. The first stop was a place called Troy, Pennsylvania, ironically, and um, and we got off the bus. And I remember my one, my daughter who's six now was one, so she was just starting to walk. And and me and my daughter who's seventeen now were walking through the fair, and it's all of these merch stands with uh, Confederate flags, at one after another. And a guy walked up to me and you know basically said like you know what 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 are you doing here, like you know are you a dancer like you know what like what are you doing here. And it was, this is Pennsylvania. I grew up in Philadelphia. So you would have never, and then we went to Ohio after. And on stage, it was a Confederate flag uh, right behind the stage. And Charlie Puth refused to go on for his sound check until they took that flag down. It's like, so this is five years ago. So we're still reminded of our place in, in, in this country. So you'll never get the tr to reconciliation. We all know the truth, but we'll never get the reconciliation. And then when you look at um, forward progression, you look at, you know, next year we celebrate, you know, well, well we not even celebrate, we look at the horrific um, events of, of, uh, of Black Wall Street. And when it was, you know- In Tulsa, and, and Oklahoma. Yeah. yeah, in Tulsa where it was an entire um, black community that, that was progressing after reconstruction that was burned to the ground because of, a, a, because of one of those Central Park caring moments, by the way. And um, so when you, when you wanna talk about looting and you wanna talk about ter uh, uh, domestic terrorism, over 300 people were murdered in the streets, um, black owned banks were burned, black businesses were burned. Um, and, it, and it decimated this entire town. And this was like just what it, it was a, a, an example of one moment where there was for, forward progression within the African American community. Since then, it's been fear around being able to build these communities or even a fear of showing wealth and showing forward progression because of these types of these types of things. So even during, the 60s and 70s, when you had things like affirm affirmative action coming into, coming into place, you had um, uh, bl uh, black corporate executives coming into America, people building black businesses, they, ha they, they had to assimilate because you couldn't, you couldn't congregate. So when you see communities that, that are thriving across the country, whether there's um, Asian communities, whether there's Jewish communities, whether there's, you know, these, these other communities where you see this forward progression and people shopping within their own stores and spending their own dollars within their communities. There's a reason why that's not happening in, 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 in America right now with African Americans, if you really do your homework. You know, um, it's, um, it's, such a, it's such a weird moment to talk about um, the entertainment industry or anything really, because uh, I think my mind and, and, and the minds of so many people watching um, is, is focused on this really um, just overwhelming conversation, the events that are happening. But um, I mean, but you are in the entertainment industry and you are really influential in the industry. And I want to, I want to ask, we actually actually getting some questions um, through YouTube and Facebook for you about that. Um, and, and this is from Andrea. She's asking, um, she says, it doesn't feel right to me to be all over social media with anything other than um, BLM content, Black Lives Matter content, um, or even to release non-political music right now. What are your thoughts on releasing music in the coming weeks? I, I, I think m music is a healer. And, and, you know, I think at the end of the day, we still need things that are going to, uh, make us smile, bring bring people together, um, you know, and and I, and I, so I think I think there's going to be a lot of um, politically and socially driven music that's born out of, born out of this moment. Um, but but I, but I do think where where I do agree is 
we, we can't walk away from the subject. We, we can't pretend that th this moment didn't, didn't happen. But, in, you know, but I don't think people should be tone deaf in this moment and, you know, and, 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 uh, and not address it. But, I, I, but the way I feel like where I know la like last night I got sick of watching the news, like, you know, cause I've been glued to, you know, between going between CNN and Fox and trying to see the contrast and messages and, and, and those things. And I, I just needed some Netflix for a second, just <laughs> to take my mind off of it. So, so hopefully people are still releasing content where we can step away and sort of refresh and, and, and have a moment where it just doesn't break us down completely. Um, I mean, speaking of, of the entertainment industry, I mean, we're also in the midst of an economic crisis and a, and a global health crisis. How do you, I mean, how is, from what you know, and and, and what, cause you're so plugged in and, and follow it and are involved with it, how is the overall situation affecting the production of music, recording music, recording albums, collaborations, um, videos, um, obviously live concerts too, but, but how, how is it affecting the, the industry right now? Uh, you know what, it's um, the good thing with the music industry, uh, our, the, our product the, in, in, on the, the record side is mostly digital. So, you know, we had the luxury of not having to rely on manufacturing plants or trucking and all of those things to get our product, you know, from here to there. And if we were still in the CD business, we'd be really screwed, you know, if people had to actually go to a store to, right. to buy the product. So I think on that side, you know, we're, we're you know, we're, we're, we're fine. Um, and, you know, we're seeing growth in subscription and, um, and that business is pretty stabilized. On the touring side is just, you know, is, is catastrophic. And, um, and the reality is we probably won't see this look normal until 2022, in my opinion. And, um, you know, just because I, I think you have, uh, one, still the social distancing. Um, you think about economically whether people are going to be able to afford tickets. You think about, you know, so all of these things, I, I think, uh, are going to have, have a, 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 a ne negative impact. But on a positive side, I think it's going to accelerate technology in terms of finding better options around live streaming. You know, with, with, um, we, we've seen a lot of things come out of like, whether it's Instagram and, and some of the other platforms and, and people going live, but those platforms weren't really built for music experiences around it. So I think um, we'll, we'll see some acceleration there. And, uh, and now I think, you know, when, when we looked at like China and, and, and South Korea and some other places, you'd see a lot of, of the bigger artists doing live streams and they have like the, uh, the virtual gifts that, and the tips that you can give to artists. So both the fans were used to that and the artists were used to that. But in the West, big artists thought that that was for like the do-it-yourself type of smaller yeah. artists. And, um, but now I think we're seeing this shift where big artists are, are, are now used to it and liking the experience and, and feeling this direct connection with the fans. And I think the fans feel like this intimacy now where I think going to concerts and seeing this big production, people, people want to see you in your home right now and see the background of your house and like, you know, kids walking past and, and yeah. you know, or, or you playing in your parents' room. So I think we're going to see this intimacy come about as well. Yeah, I mean, um, and by the way, anyone watching, if you haven't heard Troy's episode on how I built this, it's one of the best of all time. It's it's a it's an epic journey. It's a hero's journey through ups and downs and crisis and collapse and triumph and everything in between. Um, and I mean, you really began as a concert promoter. I mean, that's how you started. I remember you talking about these small venues in West Philly and and getting ca bags of cash and getting into the bank. And um, and then of course, driving up and down California in a van with, with Lady Gaga. I mean, concerts and live events are so much a part of your early success. Um, and there's a magic to it. There's a magic to being in a space with a lot of people and connecting with a lot of people. And I wonder whether, I don't know, I mean, you say 2022, but I wonder whether 
it will ever come back? I don't know. It, is that a crazy question to ask? Well, I, you know, I know like where I think I think it'll come back. You know, I, I think, but at the same time, I think technology can provide a, 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 a rich experience when you think about sort of augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, I was just telling a friend recently, like where in, in, con, in concert, the live concert experience is good in one sense, terrible in another sense, because only a small percentage of people have really good seats, by the way. Right. So, you know, so because some of the seat is just terrible, like where you don't see the details and artists work so hard on like these details and the nuance with lighting and all of these things. And I think technology can provide everybody with a much better seat and a much better experience than even being there live. So I, I don't think live would go completely away, but I do think technology can provide a, a very rich experience. And if I'm over the age of 65, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to a, a, a U2 or, or Eagles concert, you know, with, with 100,000 people in, in, in the audience, right? Um, so I think, you know, seeing some of these legacy bands is going to be tough, you know, just because with... with you know, sort of short of a vaccine and, and all of these things, I don't think people are really going to take that risk. Yeah. And um, so, but I do think this is going to provide a, a good opportunity. I want to talk to you about your business, Q&A, because um, you launched this last, just last year, right? And, and, and starting a company in normal times is already hard. And you've, known, you've launched several companies and have been really successful as an investor and entrepreneur. Um, now you've got this new team. I think you've got more than 30 people on your team. It's a music and technology company. Um, tell me a little bit about how you as an entrepreneur and a, and, a, and, a, and a founder of a business are just kind of dealing with it as a as a business leader. How are you dealing with your team? How are you guys getting your work done? How are you thinking about your business model? Um, because I'm assuming that even, even with a resilient, you know, company like the one you've built, you probably are still facing some some choppy waters ahead. Yeah, I, I got it, it's funny. You you got by now guy, this is I think this is our third interview. So so you get I think you know me well enough to know I'm a little crazy when it comes to like uh risk and 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 taking taking swings. And what I realized is all three companies um, that I found it now were started during crisis. You know, I think the fir first one was like uh, during the dot com bubble, and uh, the second one, you know, when I signed Gaga was during the you know the the two thousand seven two thousand eight crisis, and then of course now now we got this one. So um, so so I think it's you know there's definitely opportunity when people are running the other way, and because I and because. I, I do think to, to this whole point about resilience, when you have founders who are willing to take a, take a, a go at starting a company now, you know they really got guts, right? Um, where I think the opportunity and where we got lucky with this one, with the software that we're launching for the music industry, um, a lot of it has to do with work from home. And we didn't um, predict that when we when we started it, and you know because we're building out workflow systems for the for the music industry, you know, which on the software side nobody ever really focused on it, and we just felt like um, it was a, a, a missing link. And when I went into Spotify and worked for Spotify for that two years, one of the things that I saw was like, okay. Spotify has some of the best technology. You know, they have a ton of engineers, some of the smartest people in the world solving their solving problems. And on the music industry side, we never really invested in technology. So, you know, when I left, I just thought a lot about um, we're, about us as a team being uniquely qualified to go after that problem. So that's what we're working on. Um, we're getting a, a bunch of questions from YouTube and Facebook um, along the lines of some of the things we we're talking about earlier. Um, this this is, comes from Space Magic, Space Magic from YouTube, um, and I'll kind of paraphrase a question, which is, you know, obviously a lot of very big artists um, 
have spoken out and have been very active in in in, in speaking out about racial injustice. Um, and and the question is, how do other content creators, from your perspective, how can they contribute um, to the conversation um, through their through their art and their music? Um, what are what are some ideas that that people can can sort of um, take away to to, to to contribute in a positive way? Yeah, I, I think some people have been, you, you've had some people who just, with the best of intention, that just don't know what to say. Yeah. Because you don't, you, because you don't want to get it wrong. And then you don't want to be silent because you're going to be viewed as complicit. So I think it's that, I think it's about being authentic through your art or your, or your, or your platform. And Billie Eilish to me, I became a Billie Eilish fan this weekend. Like, cause I, I already like, I, I really liked her music a lot. And, um, and that was probably the one album me and my daughter, my 17 year old daughter could agree on that we could listen to in the car together besides Stevie Wonder. And, um, but her message to her fans was, was, was wonderful. And it was so authentic and it was, and it was honest. So where the expression may not come out through your art in itself or a song itself, but if you could be authentic about the way that you're feeling and recognize the, the, the injustice that's happening, just say it, just say it. And, yeah. and don't, don't be scared to, to alienate uh, fan groups that may disagree because as an artist, I think it's, it's your responsibility. That's what art's about. That's what true art is about. True art is about expressing what's, what's in your heart, being able to um, really, really talk about what's going on in the moment and be, and be, a, be a voice for the voiceless through, through whatever your medium may be. So whether that's filmmaking, whether that's photography, whether that's poetry, whether that's music, um, you know, just be authentic about it. But but I would just say don't be silent. Even yeah. if you don't know what to say, just just say say say, say what's on your heart. Um, I love that advice. Thank you for that. Um, this is a question from um, Nat Irvin um, from YouTube. He asks, "How are you? How are you communicating with your team right now? I mean, you've got a team, you've got a, a business and a company. Um, is it is it regular Zoom calls? Is it? I mean, are you able to function more or less in a normal way?" Yeah, we were. You know, for us, it was really easy. We we went into shelter at home um, probably a few weeks before. Um, it was it was mandated in, in in LA. Like it's funny when I saw when I saw Jeff Bezos and and Google and Spotify do it. I'm like they have a lot of data. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're gonna we're we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna call it right now. Um, but our team, uh, we already had people who work remotely. Um, our business was easy to sort of readjust. We you know we had a a, a Google Meet culture already and then and we're super communicative so um so it, we we just kind of hit the ground running um i'm so sick of zoom calls right now <laughs> like, sorry I, you know, i'm sorry about this oh no Here listen this this is, is at least at least this is like when i tell you it's is it's it's been non-stop back to back in terms of sitting down doing doing uh zoom so i'm hoping somebody can reinvent the video conferencing format to, to, to take us out of the square boxes and make us feel like we're, we're, t we're together in the same room. Um, this is a question from Will Plays. Um, he asks, um, do you think that the music industry is, is suffering right now? I mean, I mean, it's, it's right. I mean, you can't promote music, um, physically promote music. You can't um, perform live. I mean, from what you, you know, I mean, is the industry, um, taking taking a hit right now yeah it's, it's funny enough i think it's taking a hit in two ways right so i think both crisis is showing the vulnerability of the music business you know i think with the pandemic you know we talked about sort of the the fragility of the touring business promotion business 
even down to going out to visit radio stations and promote the records and doing late night shows and all of that stuff, you know, you, you sort of see where the fragility is. Um, what we're seeing uh, with, with the, so that's COVID related. What we're seeing with the sort of racial crisis that's going on, you know, the music industry is just as biased as, uh, you know, I think the NFL is doing better than the music business when it comes to um, the ratio between um, what black music has contributed financially to the music industry, what black culture has contributed, you know, financially to the music industry. And when you look at the ratio of actual black executives in the music industry, yeah. it's, a, it's appalling. So, you know, people talk about how the NFL only has, you know, three or four black coaches and, you know, um, and no African-Americans in the front office. The music industry is much, much worse than, wow. than, than, than the NFL. And you actually, believe it or not, have white people that are the heads of black music with the title at some of these companies. You know, it's and literally you have qualified black executives in the in, in the company, but they they but actual white people with a title, the head of black music, hmm. it's, it's like it's crazy. And so, like the fact that the music industry that prides itself on being progressive and 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 providing opportunities still has these structures in, in, in place. And I think the last couple of weeks ha has sort of brought this con that part of the conversation to, to a head as, as, as well. It sounds like, it sounds like if ever there was gonna be a kick in the butt, um, I mean, now, now would be that moment. You would have Absolutely. To. Um, and it's about it's about being fair, guy, and it's and and that's the thing where it's the 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 opportunity opportunity when 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 we think of when we think about fairness. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rephrase that because I, I, I want to be very, very, very frank. Yeah. So a lot of people are under the impression that it's like, okay, every, every, everybody has a, has, has a shot. We live in a country where everybody has a shot. But when you look at our, the education system, you look at where, where, where people actually start from. I know for a fact my personal journey was what what was incredibly difficult and i know how much luck was on my side i know how much things just had to go completely right at any given moment for things to go well but but it is i had to get very very lucky to 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 get where 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 i am today and we don't want handouts. That's the thing. Like where I, I had to explain to somebody this 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 weekend. Uh, you know, they're like, okay, we want to do you know a, a, a foundation to for, for black businesses, and I'm like, no, it's not a foundation. Like those black businesses should be held in the, in to the to the same standard of return on capital. It's just the opportunity to have access to that capital have access to, to, to the support and training that that Y Combinator companies may get or that, you know, first round capital companies may get. Like, it's just uh, that Andreessen Horowitz gives their companies. It's just a, it's just a matter of access. And, 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 and even when in places where we may, like, and, and where certain individuals may fall short because they may not have the background Let's lean in a little bit more. Like when, like it's almost like when, when, when you had to stay after school to get that extra time in. Give yeah. them that extra time to, to 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 take that test, understanding that there may be a little bit more of a of a of a learning curve, but giving them the ability to catch up. And um, and that's that that's the part that that that's challenging. 
and like and I, I, I went through something a, a, a couple of years ago, like a, a dispute. And what I was explaining to the person on the other side of the, of the dispute, I, I, I said, I made a statement along the lines of, I said, as a black executive, there's a lot of other black executives behind me. So you hurting me isn't just hurting me, it's hurting a lot of black executives behind me. And the person said, and they, they actually said it to TMZ, they said, Troy, Troy Carter uses the race card. Hmm. I said, the race card? I'm like, you're, you're born with the, with the deck of cards. You're born with the deck. And you, get the, you use that deck every single day. So the fact I have to educate you on the impact of what you're doing and how it impacts other people, we're just not, we're like, it, it's a different, it, it, it's, it's, it, the, the results are different. Yeah. If we, um, if we watch this video in five or 10 years from now, and you could, you could imagine um, how, how this moment um, will change things or impact things. Um, what do you, what do you think could happen? I mean, are you, it's, I don't want to ask if you're hopeful because I hate that question, but it's sort of a version of that question, you know, are you, do you think that this moment can, can, can really actually change things and move the needle in a significant way that, that other moments haven't? If, if, his, if, if American history teaches us anything, the answer would be no. And but as a as a as a as an entrepreneur and somebody who is just crazily optimistic about about everything, I am optimistic that this is going to have an impact on this generation who may not put up with what they're seeing right now because it impacts them on a personal level as well. So where race may not be, race may not impact you, but I can promise you the lack of economic opportunity is gonna impact a lot of people. That's gonna be the big, that's gonna be the bigger impact guy. And that's the part that nobody's talking about right now. It's like, it is the, 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 the where, where, where we have a lot in common in terms of, across every single race and, and, uh, and ethnicity and, and, and gender it's, um, and, and, and religion is economic divide. Yeah. And, 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 and with economic divide, that's when we're gonna see opportunities go away. And so if we're looking in 10 years, 10 years, we're gonna see the impact that technology is gonna have on the workforce. And, and how many jobs are going to go away? And at, at and and when we look at where education is right now, and, and and education won't keep up with technology. And if we look at um, how how fast things are moving, in ten years, people will have even more in common. So I think right now is the time where we could at least try to get ahead of that. Tr Climate change is going to be a, a, a big conversation that we're all going to have in common. Yeah. So we need we need to have a lot more empathy right now. I just I just I just beg people just be empathetic. Take yeah. down bias for, to, for for just one second and just look at the history of what's happened with race in our country. Just look at it. Look at what happens in communities in our country. Look at like where it, it, when people talk about black on black crime, people talk about what's what's happened in family structures. With, with look look at look at the the psychological impact that slavery has had on families. Where I couldn't imagine my kids being torn out of my arms. Yeah, I couldn't imagine being pitted up against another black person because of our, the different shades of our skin
because I'm darker than this person and they're lighter than me and we're pitted up against each other. I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine all of these things. And, and, and so to, to just have some empathy around, around, around this issue, let's just admit that we got it wrong as a country and go and, and, and take a step back and try to fix this moving forward. Let's just try, let, let's have some empathy right now. Troy, um, stand by. I want to I wanna briefly just say hello to some folks watching. I'm not going to get to everyone's name. I know there are a lot of questions for Troy, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them because we're, we're out of time. But just a quick hello to Joy Fennell in Harlem, uh, Melissa Serres in Michigan, Mary Eileen in Amherst, Massachusetts, Nasra Al-Hashmi in the Arabian Gulf, Joanna Langston in Leicester in the UK, Elsa Jungman, or Jungman in San Francisco, um, Will Plies in South Africa, thanks for listening and watching, Anna Manzuro in Southern Spain, Adrian Corker in Canmore, Alberta in Canada, um, so many others um, in New Delhi, Piyush Srivastava in, in New Delhi, um, Amy Montgomery Cornette in Florida, thank you so many more, I can't name them all. Um, we're gonna be back here today um, for another conversation at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. For a conversation with Kevin Hart that was also scheduled for this week. I know oh, Troy. Tell, tell Kevin I, said hello. I will Kevin's say hello from, from you. Philly. Um, I know you guys are both from Philly, and I'm um, so excited to have Kevin join us here, right here at um, 6 p.m. Eastern time today. So please join us for that. Um, you know him as an investor, but he's got this incredible new Audible uh, book out um, about about you know about him and 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 managing how he sort of manages resilience um, and and how he thinks of, 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 of about leadership. So we'll be back here in case you missed um, any of my conversation with Troy, it'll be up on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash how I built this or on the NPR Facebook uh, YouTube page. It's um, uh, easy to find. Uh, we're also gonna post an excerpt from this conversation on our podcast, so look out for that. Um, and finally, we have a brand new episode of How I Built This. It came out Monday. We're still dropping new episodes, and you know our production timeline is, is far in advance. We take two, three months to to put the shows out. Um, I probably interviewed you, Troy, six months before your episode actually was released because we do a lot of production. Um, so we have a new episode that came out Monday. It's a really cool story about Sub Pop, the history of Sub Pop with the founders of Sub Pop. Um, and, and that's it. We're going to be back here um, later today with Kevin Hart, so join us then. Troy Carter. Um, so great to have to see you. Um, so great seeing you in November in person in San Francisco. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for um, just being here and your wisdom. And um, hope to see you when we get when we're all able to see each other face to face again. Yes, and thank thank you, guy, and thank thank you for giving us this platform. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.